What goes on in a squadron meeting? Well, it depends on the uh, the week, really. Uh, for example, this week we'll be doing cleaning, cleaning the wing headquarters, which is uh, basically our trade-off for what we get to do to stay here. Um, but other nights we'll be doing testing so cadets can advance in their grade or rank. Uh, they'll also be doing PT testing as long as that. Uh, usually there are several several classes scheduled that cadets sit in on so they can gain uh, knowledge and then there are other activities that they can go and put that knowledge to use such as um, like a drill class or uniform classes to improve cadets. Uh, other than that, not much. <laughs> what positions are cadets tasked to? Well, it depends what, once again, what position you're at. Uh, if you're talking about uh, your executive staff, talking about your cadet commander, talking about your deputy cadet commander and your executive officer, those are the people who uh, basically do all the planning prior to the meeting. So really, they're not going to be the most active. They're going to be probably the least active. They're really there at that point to supervise, especially the cadet commander. Um, people may think a cadet commander is lazy, but that's just because he did all the hard work up to it. Uh, what I think is the most important key, or most important part, is probably your NCOs, your flight sergeants, and your flight commanders. They're just getting orders right on, right on the spot, and they're just supposed to execute it immediately to their best abilities. And that's what I think is the uh, really the key, the stronghold, the uh, cadet squadron is your, your flight staff, your line staff, as the captain calls it. Uh, there's uh, many different uh, many different positions that cadets could hold. Uh, starting from lowest, we have an uh, element member, and after that, we have uh, assistant element leader, which they basically just uh, are basically second hand to the element leader. Element leader is next. Uh, they're in charge of about three to four, sometimes five cadets at a time, and they uh, basically keep track of how the progression of their cadets are doing. Uh, after the element leader, we move up to flight sergeant. The flight sergeant is basically in charge of uh, the element leaders. The element leaders report to the flight sergeant. Flight sergeant deems what need, they need to be worked on. And then the flight sergeant reports to the flight commander. The flight commander is in control of the whole flight and the flight sergeant making sure that each cadet knows what they're doing. And then after that, the flight commander reports to the cadet commander. The, com uh, the cadet commander is basically in charge of the whole uh, squadron on the cadet level. Uh, they uh, are also a channel between the senior members uh, and the cadets. Uh, the cadet commander has uh, quite a few responsibilities in making sure that the meetings go on without a hitch. Uh, events that we do, we can do funerals. We've done 21 gun salutes at funerals. Um, we can do honor guard event, honor guard ceremonies, uh, banquet ceremonies. We can do color guard presentations for local high schools um, or for events that we have for, through Civil Air Patrol. And pretty much other than that, we do parades. And parades are actually a big, big source of what we do. Uh, emergency services is divided into several different categories, the first of which would be search and rescue. Uh, that's broken down into two main parts, which is downed aircraft and missing persons. So a downed aircraft has an ELT going off, which is a radio beacon that uh, sends out a signal and we have equipment to track it down. Uh, missing persons is more coordinated with uh, local authorities. Uh, they basically ask for our help and we'll go in and help them out. Uh, the next category would be disaster relief. Um, Main things we do in that are air and ground transportation, uh, moving people or things uh, as uh, the government asks us to. Uh, com communications network, uh, during a disaster, mainly all the phone lines are going to be out. Uh, so we have our radio system that I'm going to talk about a little later, and we can use that. Um, we do damage assessment, aerial damage assessment. We can uh, use our planes, take pictures of damaged areas, and send them to the customer, which would be uh, the local government. Um, we also fly supplies in the areas of need. Uh, the next uh, area is, is pretty new, it's Homeland Security. Um, we do security both from the air and on the ground. 
The main things that we do security for on the air and on the ground is uh, the shuttle launches for NASA. Uh, we fly, fly our aircraft around, make sure that there's no suspicious activity. Um, and another thing was the Olympics a while ago. We uh, did some security for that, and that actually led to a few arrests. Um, September 11th, we did damage assessment. There, the, actually, the first aircraft that was up in the airspace after the September 11th attacks that was non-military was a Civil Air Patrol aircraft. We were flying damage assessment for that area. My role, currently, I am, I have the qualifications of being ground team member one, two, and three, and ground team leader. I'm also a ground branch director. I'm a mission staff assistant, communications unit leader, mission radio operator, flight line marshaller, and I'm working on the flight line supervisor. And I think that's all of them. Oh, urban direction finding. I mostly participate in the ground team member. We pretty much get called out middle of the night, possible plane crash. We grab our gear up, we go out, and we find it hopefully in a quick and proficient manner. Um, for ground team, see the, the first task in the ground team manual just lists all the gear that you need, and it's a good page and a half of gear. Um, uh, for ground team member, there is uh, two different types. There is 24-hour gear, 72-hour gear, just depending what equipment you're going to need for how long of a time period. We have everything from parachute cord to reflected tape. So for ground team, this is this is a pretty much something that we standard use. This is what we call our 72-hour gear, which basically we can stay alive in the field for 72 hours just with this. So it's got uh, food in there in the form of MREs, which are meals ready to eat. It's just pretty much a uh, not uh, we don't even like heat it up or anything; you just eat it. Um, then you got all kinds of other survival equipment, equipment that you need to do the mission, such as find the downed aircraft or things like that. Um, Obviously, you can see this is a really big pack. Uh, we think it probably weighs about 80 pounds. Um, but usually what you would do, because this is your 72 hour year, uh, if you're going to go on a mission, you would go out, make a base, you would set up your shelter, and drop this big thing off here, and then you could detach this smaller pack, and that's your uh, 24 hour year. So you could stay on the field for 24 hours and then go back to your camp, and uh, you got the rest of your 72 hour year there. Eat. Helpers, which are radio, pretty much radio boxes on antennas to figure out where a signal is coming from. Uh, then for flight line marshaller, you need an uh, extinguisher in case the plane starts on fire. And uh, communications part, you need a radio. Other than that, just a bunch of maps and food. Uh, I'll run you through a normal day, uh, what goes on, and I'll break it down as fast as I can. Uh, normally staff will wake up at 5.30, we can dress the shower, they shave as much as they can, we'll get things done. And then at 6.30 there's revel, and that's where the entire encampment gets up. And then PTF, or PT, will start promptly at 6.05. We, we flip on the lights, we start yelling at cadets, get up, get up, get up, get up as fast as you can. You know, they jump out of bed, kind of groggy, they jump in their shoes almost, and they're standing at attention in front of their backs. Now mind, most of these cadets are not morning people, but we train them to become morning people at this encampment. At that time, we'll do a little PFT, we'll get them ready to roll, get their uniform on, we go outside for formation, and we do opening formation. That's where the entire encampment lines up, they all report. Once that's done, order of child is announced. It's normally Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta Echo, or in any specific order that they deem who is the best flight at that time. From there, they'll go to, they'll go to breakfast. Everyone goes to breakfast, breakfast, as much as they can. They file through the channel line, and then they go to the classes. Now, this is what this encampment is really about, is all the classes. Most kids don't like it because they can't stay awake, and that's fine. Uh, you may have a, a specific or almost a squadron, you know, six flight, three flights go to one area. And in this area, you'll learn about aerospecification. You'll be talking to Air Force personnel. You may even have a class about Air Force, about the Air Force, or what the military has to offer for you in the future. On top of that, you'll also have a moral leadership class, but not in every day. Specifically at spring encampment, we, uh, we as the cadets, we are able to go on the 
uh, USS Marlin Spike, which is the Navy training vessel, which they have indoors. It's a mock ship, and they teach you how to lo load with fuel and talk you through it, but they mainly teach you how to dock a, a ship, a vessel at that point in time, and that's really cool. And it gets the cadets active, and it teaches them teamwork, and this is a big thing about the encampment, is it's really all about teamwork. Now, while this is all going on between classes and going to special activities, another one which is diving off a swim platform, that's great, which is actually uh, heavy weather or seawater survival training. Uh, between all this, cadets are competing to become the honor flight. And this is the flight that is deemed the best flight. And in between there, you have the cadet who is working their hardest to become the honor cadet in the gamut. And that's great. And also with that, you also have staff members who are vibing for the honor staff in the position. Now, while this is going on, cadets will go back to launch. And the same process will be again. You'll have another class and a different subject. And this is great because it really keeps, it's a really structured situation and it keeps things going along at the same pace. At the end of the day, you'll have closing formation. You're going to go to dinner, come back. Cadets get a half hour of their free time. Normally, we, normally they polish their boots and get prepped up for the next day. And everyone goes to bed at the same time and the process begins all again. Uh, I've been to cadet officer school, which is held at Maxwell Air Force Base. Base. You have to be at least a cadet officer to go, and I believe 16 years of age. Uh, the best activity I've been at, I suggest it to anybody. It was really fun. Pretty much, it's uh, a collegiate environment where they give you your own dorm. They tell you where to be at what time, and other than that, you get free roam of the Air Force Base. Uh, it's it was really cool because you got to play volleyball against all their teams and they did a lot of team building activities. Really cool people who came and talked to us. There's pretty much everyone who talked to us had a doctorate degree or was the top of their field. There are a couple guys who wrote books who actually came and talked to us about the books and the section of reading which we had to read and all. Um, other than that, is a good event, best thing I've done. I'm still talking to a bunch of people who were in my flight. Two people are at the Air Force Academy. One has gotten her spots and yeah, that's about it. Drill Team is a competition that was set up back in the 60s for a bunch of cadets to get together and compete to see who's the best Wait, who has, which wing has the best cadets, and then which region, and then ultimately the national cadet competition, and then the drill team wins it as the best drill team. How many cadets? It's 12 people on the innovative drill and the standard Hello. drill, but there are actually 16 people on the team, and you can have as many alternates as you want, and the events are innovative drill, which you have your own routine, you do it, and then standard drill, they give you a card of so many drill commands. Inspection, you just walk out there, stand there, look pretty, and then you get your stuff done. Uh, next would be the mile run. You're timed by how fast you can run the mile, and then your total score is added up and put against everyone else's score. The panel quiz is kind of like Jeopardy, except you have four people on each one of your panel quiz teams. You have four teams and they compete against the different regions and it's, you just have a buzzer in your hand, whoever can buzz in first and answer the question correctly, gets that point and whoever gets the most points on the round wins. Total cumulative points wins that event. And then finally is the written, ex actually, the written exam and that's just your team's total uh, questions right. And finally is uh, volleyball where your team goes against the rest of the regions. Well, inspection is one of the events in the national and regional cadet competitions that judges the correctness and integrity of the uniform. Normally, for the regional competition and the national competition are judged by honor guard members. Um, however, for the regional comp for the national competition, uh, it is judged by the Air Force Honor Guard versus a base honor guard. What the honor guard will be looking for is the alignment of the ribbons, alignment of your duct tape, correct placement of your ribbons, basically the order of precedence. Uh, the wear of the shoulder cord, the correct distance in your wing patch. Right here, make sure it's an inch and a, a half an inch. Tight tack center, length, and everything overall.
Okay, what we have here is a fine example of the cadet. You see it, all of his ribbons are in correct order. From the highest precedence being his Air Force expert marksman to his lowest being his recruiter, which he has apparently six of Now the hard part about him is he has so many ribbons here that he also has badges on top. These are his solo wings, mm -hmm. and then these are his uh, ground branch director. And he also has an ES badge. This is difficult because he also has a cord on top. So with all these, you have to be very careful and very precise to make sure you read your manual, manual correctly so you get everything correct on this. Versus a cadet who may only have the grade or rank. He may only have as many ribbons as a cadet like this. You see a cadet in Delaney almost has about 30. And this cadet has roughly almost 12. She's getting very close. So you can see the very difference of how careful it gets between dis distinguishing where your cadets, where your ribbons actually have to go. Uh, standard drill, the definition of it is the orderly movement of a formation from one place to another or one location to another. And basically what that does, it allows people to get uh, to and from wherever they need to be on time and in an orderly fashion. Uh, practicing, we take basic movements and we actually take and go through and practice each and every single basic movement, um, doing various flanking movements, uh, columns, facing movements, and things of that nature. Innovative drill is uh, completely different the way we do it. There is only uh, one command and that's to start the drill routine. After that everything else is silent. Uh, it's actually simpler than you would think because it's repetitive, nothing changes, so you aren't going to get surprised on anything. Standard drill is hard because it's uh, all really on the commander, and then the commander will tell the cadets what to do, and they have no idea what's on the card, so it's kind of like a surprise. Um, I like innovative more. It's fun because you get to do a bunch of cool stuff, and it, it really involves a lot of timing. You have to know how to but uh, other than that. The mile run competition, um, well, where we ran at Nationals, the uh, maximum was five people on the track, and you had to run a mile, half mile out and a half mile back. With that, you take a cumulative, a cumulative time of all the teams, of all the people on the team, you add them up to total score. If it's a female running, they automatically subtract a minute and a half as a handicap and then they add up the total times, and whatever team has the lowest total time is how they run. Uh, the females have a different result time than the males. The average male time is roughly about 6.30 to 6 minutes. If you run there for a male, you're doing fine. To be a super competitive male to run in that upper, that upper echelon, the, the uh, top 10 runners at NCC, you're going to have to run a very low 5 or a high 7 or a high 4 minute mile. And that's pretty hard to run. For the females, I believe their standing time is about eight, uh, 7.30 for total. Uh, basically we just do a lot of different drills. And, uh, we have a lot of practice games, so we get a lot of experience on the court, uh, both with games and doing drills, practicing uh, specific skills such as bumping, spiking, setting, that's what we like. Uh, well, we only have nine people on the court at a time, so and even that gets a little congested, so we really have to communicate well. Uh, basically, if you're going to hit it, you call a mine. Uh, you know, you have to try and keep out of each other's ways and make sure that someone gets the ball. And uh, that takes a lot of communication, and that's what a lot of practice is for. Uh, Alright, the court, you have nine people, you have three rows of three. Um, the two corners near the mat are the spikers. The center in the front is the setter. So, and then the back six people will basically bump it, and uh, the, the setter will set it, and the spikers will come up and spike it over the net. That's ideally how it would work. Usually it doesn't work out like that just because the ball doesn't come in right or something, but uh, ideally that's how it would work. It would be the back, people in the back would bump it, and then the setters would set it, and the spiker hits it over.